brothers and sisters in Christ, God created us to know joy in communion with him, to love all humanity, and to live in harmony with all creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation, and so we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended for us. By our sin we grieve our Father, who does not desire us to come under His judgment, but to turn to Him and live. Therefore God in His mercy has sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take our place under the law, to suffer for us, and to die the death we deserve. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. During the 40 days of Lent, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The time of Lent reminds us that to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, we must also know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to commit yourselves to this struggle. Let us be silent. Let us be still. Let us come before the mercy of God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned by our own fault, by our own grievous fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, Lord. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, Lord. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. We confess to you, O Lord, our self-indulgent appetites and ways, our manipulation of other people. We confess to you, O Lord, our anger when our selfish aims are denied and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. We confess to you, O Lord, our love of worldly goods and comforts, and our dishonesty in daily life and work. We confess to you, O Lord, our negligence in worship and prayer, and our failure to show the faith that is in us. We confess to you, O Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Forgive us, O Lord, for all false judgments, 
for uncharitable thoughts toward others and for our prejudice and contempt for those who differ from us. Forgive us, O Lord, for what we think or say or do that is at variance with your will. Forgive us, O Lord. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and suffering of your Son, O Lord, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. Therefore, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live, we implore you to have compassion on the frailty of our mortal nature, for we acknowledge that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. 
mercifully pardon our sins, that we may obtain the promises you have laid up for those who are repentant. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one and forever. Amen. Our God and our Lord speaks to our hearts in his word. The first reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 59. Yes, our rebellious deeds are many before you, and our sins testify against us. Our rebellious deeds are with us, and as for our guilty deeds, we know them. Rebellion and treachery against the Lord, and we turn back from following our God. We incite oppression and apostasy. We conceive and utter deceitful words from our heart. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away for truth stumbles in the city square and uprightness cannot end. Truth is missing. And the one who turns aside from evil becomes prey. The Lord saw that there was no justice and it was evil in his sight. He saw that there was no man and he was appalled that there was no intercessor. So his own arm worked salvation for him. And his own righteousness supported him. So he clothed himself with righteousness like body armor. With a helmet of salvation on his head. He clothed himself in garments of vengeance. And he wrapped himself with zeal like a cloak. He will repay in full what they have earned. Wrath to his foes, full payment to his enemies. He will repay even the distant islands. From the west, they will fear the Lord's name. And from the rising of the sun, they will fear his glory. For he will come like a raging river, driven by the Spirit of the Lord. Then a Redeemer will come for Zion, for those in Jacob who turn from rebellion. The Declaration of the Lord. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 18. Glory be to you, O Lord. Jesus told this parable, to certain people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on others. Two men went up to the temple courts to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself like this, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. However, the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but was beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went home justified rather than the other. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We sing the first five stanzas of the hymn, In Adam We've All Been One.
in loving contemplation, fix our hearts and eyes on you till we taste your full salvation and your unveiled glory view. Amen. There are so many things that can happen in a day in that 24-hour span of time. On the one hand, we can think of all the activities we try to pack into that 24 hours, and it seems as if the older we get, the less time we have to do all of those things. My 83-year-old father always tells me, I don't have time for that. And I look and we're the ones that have the children and have to get them up and, and, and make them breakfast and get them dressed after doing the laundry, of course, then transport them in and then, and then do our own work and then pick them up and get them to the dentist, the eye doctor, and to the violin and choir and softball practice and then baths and bed. That's a lot. On the other hand, we can also think of this in the sense that we can wake up in the morning and assume that the day is going to go a certain way and then the day turns out drastically and dramatically different. One day could change a life forever. Our midweek Lent services this year will give us a moment to think of sp some specific days that happen in the Bible. Days that we don't ordinarily give a lot of thought to. And outside of today, all those days that we're going to look at in the weeks to come are going to be the other days of Holy Week. We, we know it happens on Palm Sunday and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but Monday, what, Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, we know they're in the Bible. And, and looking at those days, they are going to give us an opportunity to, to think about some, some really big ideas. But now the day that we have here today takes us way before Jesus. It is a big day to be sure. Because it's the day that really sets everything into motion. It sets the course of our earthly lives into motion. You could even say that this day was the very first Ash Wednesday. This day was the last day that Adam and Eve were in the paradise of Eden. And this day was the last day that the Lord spoke to Adam and Eve in that paradise. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife's voice and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. The soil is cursed on account of you. You will eat from it with painful labor all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles will spring up from the ground for you. But you will eat the crops of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the soil. For out of it you were taken. For dust, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. How we came to this day, that's an account we know well, probably just about the most well-known Bible story for us. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They sinned. They actively rebelled against God's command. Adam and Eve were the created. And they were created to have a special relationship with the Creator Himself. Now what did God create Adam and Eve from? From the dust. But it's described for us in such a marvelous, wondrous way. We have to think in our minds here when God made man of an artist, a sculptor, creating an absolute masterpiece, putting everything exactly where he wanted and adding every detail just the way he wanted it. 
Indeed, he created man and woman fearfully and wonderfully. And having this special place in all of God's creation, he gave them that one command by which they could render worship to him, but he also attached to that command a consequence for disobedience. On the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And this has always made me wonder. Adam and Eve knew what God had said because Eve says that to the serpent when he tempted them. Did they really know what dying and death was? Did they really understand what dying and death was? Because we know that the devil was right. They had no, no evil up to this point. So how could they ever know what dying and death really is? Did they really know what the Lord was saying when he said this, this last day in paradise? For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Obviously, they're going to know it. And they're going to know it in the same exact way that we know it. Because we see it and we experience it. It's not only the refrain that's heard on a typical Ash Wednesday, right? You are dust, and to dust you shall return. But it's repeated at funerals, at grave sites again and again and again. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Ash Wednesday, we tend to think of ashes being more so connected with sin, but really, in its heart, it's connected to death. But of course, the connection between those two things are absolutely essential. We don't die because of disease. We don't die because we get sick. We don't die because of injury and accident. We die because of our sin. Of course, I could go on living under some kind of delusion that I don't sin and therefore I don't deserve to die. But then, when that day finally comes, it will be absolutely clear. The soul that sins is the soul that dies. How will this dying come? When God made the body, he made it to last. It was incorruptible. It was imperishable. But as the curse of sin cast itself over Adam and Eve and all humanity, this body that God has made, even though he still makes us and our bodies fearfully and wonderfully, this body doesn't last very long. It's not meant to last very long. Because there's sin in this body. There is death in this body. Of course, today especially, and then during the season of Lent, we could do what we did here at the beginning in the confession, and as we went through those things, perhaps specific instances of how you have sinned came into your minds. Perhaps we don't necessarily need that today. We just need to look at our bodies and know that they are subject to decay and to deterioration because this body is corrupted by my sin. I know that I'm heading for one place. Back to the dirt. Even as we, you know, consider our bodies, we may look at ourselves in the mirror. Like a lot of the people do at the gym I go to, I don't think they're checking out to make sure their form on their curls are, is correct. I think they're looking at the mirror for some other reasons. They see their image. They think they're healthy. Maybe you've eaten well your entire life and you have the perfect microbiome going on in your gut. 
Finally, it should be clear to us that we can find no strength in our body, in our living, by which we could possibly rescue ourselves from death. Just think about it. If we can't even will ourselves into living forever and not dying, how in the world do we ever think we could will ourselves into living spiritually? There is that psalm that sings, I praise you, Lord, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. There's another psalm that sings that the Lord God knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Usually what we say this day, I say to you, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return because that's an inconvenient truth, isn't it? One that we want to forget. We don't want to think about our dying. It's kind of an automatic way of thinking for humans. And even though we have to be reminded that we in fact are dying, God never forgets. God can't forget. He remembers. And he surely didn't forget the last words to Adam and Eve on this last day in Eden when he said, dust you are and to dust you shall return. He remembers that we are dust. But whenever God remembers, that's always the moment when God acts. And what does God do? God has not left us in the dust. Because we know that God has not left us in our sin. Of course, this day, ashes, right? The sign of remorse, of contrition, of confession of sin. We, we live our lives and we sin and we sit in the dust. But God does not leave us in the dust. He remembers that we are dust and he knows why. Because he knows our sin. So what does he do for us? He constantly lifts us up out of our sin. Again and again. That constant exercise of our earthly life. He does not leave us in our sins. He comes to us and he speaks through a brother and sister in Christ and they open their mouth and his words come pouring out, I forgive you your sins. He doesn't leave us in the dust. He does not leave us in our sins. He has come. He has rescued us in the waters of our baptism. He comes, he forgives us in his body and blood. He does not leave us in our sins. Because that last day in, in the paradise of Eden, this doesn't only set the stage for where our life is headed, but this also locks in God to his plan of salvation in an even more remarkable way. This day in Eden sets the stage for Jesus. And in a way for our Lent, dust is death. And as we start our Lent here, with dust you are and to dust you shall return, we also know where, where's it going to end? Lent will end with dying. It will be the death of Jesus. True God who became true man and what did he have to do? Take on flesh. A body. That same dust by which God has created us so he was formed in his humanity and knew for himself the same 
decay of the body and the sufferings that he endured for our sin. Because you cannot separate those. You cannot separate sin from death and you cannot separate sin from death in Jesus either because it is for your sins he dies. It is your death he dies. Because God does not leave you in your sin. And we are also absolutely certain that this doesn't just end with dying. When our bodies are committed to their resting place, however, wherever that may be, so will the body of Jesus be laid to rest after salvation's hard work. No doubt a much needed rest for that blessed body that bore our sin and suffered hell itself. So another psalm sings, You will not let your Holy One see decay. Dying ends with living. And this is also why we can be certain that God has not only not left us in our sin, but he does not leave us in our sin. On that day in Eden, that last day in paradise, when God spoke, dust you are, to dust you shall return, he no doubt also had this in mind. The perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. And the mortal with immortality. And on that day, I will know in this very body when the imperishable, when the perishable is clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, I will know that truth. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And so we begin our Lent. And we know God does not leave us in the dust. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's join together our hearts and our voices to confess our faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus our Lord and for all people according to their needs.
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you desire not the death of sinners, but rather that we would turn from our evil and live. So turn us again, O God of our salvation, and let your anger cease. Spare us from every evil to body and soul. Look graciously upon your holy church and preserve your gospel among us. Renew us in this penitential season to strive against the desires of our flesh and to grow in the joy of your salvation and to look in love and service toward our neighbors. Look graciously on the families of our congregation and also on our nation and its leaders, all civil servants and those who protect us and work for the common good. Drive away all disease and fear from us and grant peace, we pray, O to all people in every place. Behold in mercy all who are sick, who suffer, and who rejoice. Be with those whose labor is dangerous, with the unemployed, those near death, and those who mourn. Give comfort to us who are dust and must return to dust that a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to offer himself as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Trusting in his mercy, bring us in repentant faith to your holy altar to eat his body and drink his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver us and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks. O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. By our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my high blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
true body and the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in Christian faith until life everlasting. Go in peace and enjoy. Your sins are forgiven in Jesus. Amen. Please stand. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. Please be seated. We sing the final stanza of the hymn, and Adam, we've all been one. Just a reminder, we'll exit the sanctuary from the back to the front without ushers, so those of you who are in the back, you can lead us out. 